When it comes to technological advancements, one of the biggest advancements of this period is going to be synthetic materials. And what I'm referring to primarily is plastics. Now, plastics, of course, are a petrochemical uh, compound made up of fossil fuels primarily and turned into these incredibly flexible products. And what do I mean by flexible? Well, the term plastic in a classic sense means something that can take on any form. And it's really a perfect term for these products. Now, plastics can play a number of different roles. We have uh, thermoplastic materials and thermosetting materials based on the idea that if you heat up a plastic to a certain point, you can shape it. And once you cool it down to room temperature, it, of course, will hold that shape. We can also color it and do any number of different things with it. And plastic has a very long history, depending on what you consider to be plastic. For example, tortoise shell was used in early plastics because you could treat it and shape it to a very isolated degree. By 1870, we see celluloids being developed. Celluloids are kind of a mix between organic materials and some uh, more petrochemical materials. And then by the time we get to about 1909, that's when we really start to see plastics taking off and where we're going to see them really coming into consumer goods. Although occasionally you do see celluloid used, not just for film, but for uh, things like radios, clocks, etc. And then we kind of go from there. Now, the advantage of plastics is I can shape them into any form using something called injection molding. The idea is... I heat up my material, uh, so here's the raw plastic beads. They come into here, they are heated, they are put under pressure, squeezed into a mold, and usually a steel mold. When that opens, the plastic part comes out. This is how we make everything from Legos to chairs to flower pots these days. It's all basically the same process, but it's an incredibly flexible process. As long as you can make a mold, you can create injection molded plastics. Now, the downside, of course, is plastic takes a long time to decompose, and we're dealing with it in places like the Pacific Gyre, the North Pacific Gyre, the South Pacific Gyre, etc. So it's become something that people are reacting against. And actually, you're seeing today a push towards a lot of organic products and organic materials being used for furniture. Uh, just because consumers are becoming increasingly conscious of the role of plastics in the environment. So I want to look at some of these plastics. One of the earliest ones is Bakelite. Now, Bakelite is a very brittle material. It's fantastic, but it is brittle. And it usually contains some kind of filler, such as fine wood dust to improve strength. Bakelite would replace ivory for billiard balls and was used for kitchenware, toys, casings for telephones, radios, and other items. And it's the sort of thing that you often look for if you're looking at certain antiques. There's actually methods of testing for whether or not something is Bakelite in, for example, costume jewelry or a radio or any number of other products. One of the easiest ways, by the way, is just to rub... Uh, rub the surface strongly with your thumb. It kind of heats it up and then you smell it. And if you're familiar with Bakelite, you will pick up on that smell. Now we also see PVC or polyvinyl chloride. Now this is primarily going to be used on the or in the building industry. We're going to see it used, for example, for window frames, moldings, floorings, pipes, furniture, etc. It's not the sort of plastic that we use in everyday items, assuming that you're not dealing with, for example, children's toys or something along those lines. It is a very useful material, but it is a very hard material and fairly heavy compared to other forms of plastics. The more common form that we tend to see is polypropylene. Polypropylene is used in everything from say, boats, to, well, pretty much all of your kids' toys if you have kids. The advantage of it is it's very cheap to create. It has great strength and reduced cracking. And this is going to be 
really important uh, because usually plastics get really brittle over time. In fact, if you've ever picked up an antique plastic item from the 1940s or 50s and you drop it, it can shatter like glass depending on the form. Well, when you use polypropylene, we get around a lot of that. Uh, it's going to be color fast for the most part, making it suitable for, for example, upholstery fabrics and carpets. Now, it does degrade under ultraviolet light, which is why you don't want to use it in an outdoor setting generally. And that's why certain things fade if you leave them in direct sunlight, at least plastic products. Now, one of the other products that they develop is called reinforced fiberglass. The textbook gets into polyresin. I'll talk about polyresin here as part of this because it's a two-part system. The fiberglass itself doesn't have a lot of strength. It's these thin strands of glass. They're usually woven into some form of mat, but you can't do anything with that. So what you have to do is apply a resin to it, either a polyresin or there are certain other forms. And what this is, is this is a product that soaks into that fiberglass and then hardens. The resin itself is incredibly brittle, but the fiberglass has a great deal of flexibility. So when you put the two together, they really mesh quite well. And so when you're working with fiberglass or building things out of fiberglass, you're always working with a mold or you're typically working with a mold. Uh, you're going to roll in your fiberglass, you're going to wet it out, which means adding the resin to it, and then once it's dry, you can pull it out of your mold and work with it. So it's a really fantastic material that we will use for things like chairs. In fact, a lot of commercial chairs until relatively recently, maybe the last 20 years, were generally fiberglass. Now we'll see synthetic fibers being developed as well. Nylon being one of the key fibers. So nylon comes about prior to World War II, and it really changes the world of fashion. It changes the world in terms of products. So we use nylon a lot. If you want something that's going to be fairly soft, if you want something that's going to be, well, fairly strong considering what you're dealing with. Uh, and it's going to be used for purposes such as uh, molding automobile parts and seat belts. It has low absorbency, which makes it resistant to mold and mildew, which is why we use it outdoors or in this case for outdoor gear. We see it used for rain gear, shower curtains. It's very, very durable. And so it's suitable as well for carpets but it's damaged by exposure to sunlight. So it works in a tent, for example, because, well, that tent isn't out in the sun all the time. It's out there for a few days, and then you put it away. Then we have olefin, and this is a fiber product made from another synthetic, uh, such as polypropylene or polyethylene, another plastic. And it has good strength even when wet and is resistant to damage by UV light. Uh, so we use it for indoor-outdoor products, such as indoor-outdoor carpets. Its qualities also make it suitable for things like draperies, upholstery, and wall coverings. In fact, many of the draperies that you would come across would be olefin. And that is, again, because it resists that damage by UV light that we see in so many other plastic and synthetic products. We'll also see the development of acrylic. Now, there are two kinds of acrylic I'm going to address. First of all, acrylic textiles. And these began to be pr uh, produced in the early 1940s. The fibers are strong and lightweight. They can mimic wool in texture and warmth. For the latter reason, is often used for cold weather clothing. Or today, we use it a lot for sweaters, but also for furnishing textiles, for example. It is color fast, but it does pill or fuzz uh, very easily and is also highly flammable. So that's kind of a problem when it comes to acrylic, but we still use it in a lot of settings. For example, wall hangings or the synthetic felts, which you might use on a table or any number of other uh, possibilities. But if we're dealing with acrylic fiber, let's deal with acrylic and latex paint, which are going to be developed and really come into fashion during the period we're looking at. 
up until 1960. In fact, eventually latex paint will surpass the lead-based paints that are going to be used prior to that. And acrylic paint and latex paint are more or less the same thing. Artistically, you could mix the two and you really don't have too many problems. The advantage is they're non-toxic and water cleanup. The disadvantage is you're basically painting your wall with plastic. So when it dries, it, it effectively becomes a plastic material. It's completely synthetic. It has a very fast dry time, usually in the 20 minute range. So it has its advantages. It has its disadvantages. But keep in mind, if you're dealing with a client who has chemical sensitivities, etc., latex and acrylic paint can actually be far worse for them than more traditional oil-based paints that you would use for an interior surface. The reason is the oil-based paints, while they smell worse at the time, that smell dissipates and the chemistry going into them is far better known than what we're dealing with with acrylic and latex, where those solvents are there, they can outgas and cause some other issues. So it's just something to keep in mind, especially in a world where chemical sensitivity becomes a bigger and bigger issue.